welcome all to this session um, uh, uh, called Cut the Crap. Um, please do uh, in the chat uh, say hello and introduce yourself. We haven't got an hour, so we haven't got a lot of time, and it's nice to get a feel for who's uh, on the other end. Say anything you like to say about how you're feeling and how the festival's been for you so far, um, and uh, introduce each other a little bit. Um, so uh, this session is um, not any preaching. I'm not going to preach um, anything to you guys. Um, this is about having honest conversations. It's quite hard to do uh, in, in an hour, um, but we're going to use the chat quite a lot. Um, I'm not entirely sure how to turn on uh, the, the sound, but I'm hoping there's some kind of magic moderator in the background that can turn on the sound for me if people want to chat. Um, and we might have a go at, at slaying some sacred cows around community leadership. Um, I hope you guys are up for that. Um, uh, and uh, I'll explain a little bit more about what that is as we go through. Um, so uh, a little bit about me. Um, some of you know me. I don't know many of the people on the list here. Um, but I'm a, uh, I would describe myself as a recovering corporate accountant. I've um, spent my life, started off as a, a, a corporate accountant in the charity sector, but was brought up by uh, cooperative community artists. And I've spent the rest of my career coming home is the way I would describe it. I certainly feel like I have sort of cooperative and, and mutualist values. But one of the things which might frame this session a little bit um, is that I, I do struggle a bit with, with uh, theory um, and I struggle a bit with idealism. I'm practical and pragmatic in many ways um, and I thought I should give you that as a health warning as we go into this conversation. Hi Bob, um, I'm oh, so hello. sorry we had a slight internet problem so I've relocated. Uh, not, not a problem, not a problem. We're, we're, we're underway so I worked out that everyone was here and could see me um, so Thank it's, all you. Good. <laughs> it's all good um, and uh, we'll, 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 we'll We'll get on through it. I won't need the, any of those slides yet, um, Megan. So I'll just Great. Uh, I'll let you carry, carry on, on chat, and I'll uh, right. mute myself and remove myself. Right. And then let me know if you want me to start letting people in for Q&As or when you want the slobs, slides, Bob. <laughs> no problem at all. I will. Great. Um, but people should use the, the chat as much as Great. possible. Great. OK. Um, Thank thanks, you. Thanks, Megan. Um, so, yeah, so I struggle with with theory quite a lot. Not that I don't value it, I just struggle with it um, and idealism. So practical, pragmatic is, is where I come at things from. Um, I love my local. So some of you have heard of the Bevy Community Pub. Um, I'm on the management committee there. And uh, uh, that is nothing if not um, very practical and down to earth. Uh, I love it there. And you're all welcome to come and join me for a pint anytime. Um, and the other thing to say, I suppose, is I'm really certain about anything. So if anything comes across as anything like certainty, um, feel, feel free to question it, challenge it, and uh, expand all our minds. Um, I just want to tell you a little bit about what led to this session, really. So I've been doing, um, with some of you on this, this uh, call, um, whole day sessions for a little while as part of the new economy program, um, where we just brought together community leaders to have an honest conversation about what was going on for them, share some of their learning and try and support each other. And we just facilitated this because one of the things that I could see in a lot of the work that I was doing was community leaders were often really struggling, um, uh, often finding themselves burning out, often struggling with the weight of expectations, both from funders and from their local communities and needed a release valve and a place where they could really say the things which they weren't. Uh, yes, math, I'm buying. Um, depends how many of you turn up. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, need a release valve and a place to be able to sort of help each other. Um, and I, I've really taken that principle on those and various other networks um, a lot further, because I think that the more we can talk about some of the things which you're sort of not allowed to talk about, the better. Um, so those whole days were really useful. People supported each other. I then did some half day online workshops where we did a similar thing as, as COVID hit. Um, and now we're doing an hour here, which is just about trying to summarize some of the things that other community leaders in those sessions over the period of the last 18 months and some other networks have really raised. And some of the things that I think at least I'm taking away is learning. Um, and this is for you to, to sort of digest, hear what people have said um, and tell me what you think. Um, so uh, we sort of have an idea of 
con growing this as well. So there's another thing you may have seen in the uh, uh, magazine that we're doing in partnership um, with Stir to Action, which is called The Secret Community Leader. Um, that's a column where people can get to say anything um, under anonymity. Um, and we're planning to do sort of half day conversations about the things that come out of those columns. So look out for those columns, look out for the future conversations where we continue to have these kind of peer chats about some of those things. So that's kind of what's led up to today. And it's all about cutting through the crap on honesty and practical peer support. Um, so uh, the first thing I want to uh, talk about is um, some of the sacred cows. Um, and actually, Megan, uh, if you could get me to slide six, which says some are some sacred cows slain, um, it, and you can put that up on for everyone to see, that'd be really useful. So here are a few of the things I want to talk about that have really come up for me in those conversations and what came from um, the uh, community leaders. Um, I'll read them out and hopefully they'll start to appear. There we are. So here are some of the things we're going to talk about. Community leaders can't be in it for the money. Community leaders must involve their community on every major decision. Community leaders must avoid conflicts of interest and community leaders must be embedded within the community they serve. Um, so those are the, 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 the sacred cows. Um, I'm going to share some stuff. And as I share it, please say in the chat if you've got a question and I can ask Megan to, to let you speak or type your question or type your challenge. Um, so go on to the next slide. There are a few rules um, that I've got for this conversation. Um, and essentially those rules are honesty, which we all need to respect. It's a confidential space. Um, be honest, feel ch be happy to challenge. No uh, good kindness in, in maths if you're in that session. Um, so no bad kindness, sorry. Plenty of good kindness, but no bad kindness. Let's learn from each other um, and let's have some fun. So those are rules. Should we dive in? Everyone ready? Yes, I assume. Everyone with me? Yes, great. Okay, so let's dive into the first uh, sacred cow. Um, can I articulate a bit more what a community leader is? Um, I think perhaps as we go through some of these sacred cows, maybe that will become clearer, Tim. But um, maybe let's have a, uh, 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 I'll have a go at it now. Um, from my point of view, a community leader is anybody that makes stuff happen in a local community. Um, I think it's as broad a definition as that, in my opinion. Other people might have other definitions. Please share them. Um, but I think a community leader is someone that sets um, ambitions, that moves things forward, that creates um, uh, excitement and energy um, and nurtures uh, local creativity and ambition in whatever a community is. We then get on to a definition of what a community is. And for me, a community is really something that defines itself. It's not something you can define from the outside. I hope that gives a kind of broad definition of what I'm coming from. Um, and I think I'm largely talking about um, communities of place, although I think a lot of this applies because um, uh, that's most of my experience, although I think a lot of this applies to communities of all, all types. Um, I hope that's uh, clear enough. So um, if we could show the slide on community leaders can't be in it for the money. So. Here's a sacred cow, um, comes up quite a lot. If you're a community leader, then you sacrifice yourself for the community is what I'm, what we hear. And lots of the systems and processes we have set up expect that. Certainly funding applications are very suspicious of people earning private benefit. Often within communities that I've heard and the conversations that were coming out of these various uh, workshops that we ran people were saying that there was lots of suspicion about what people were in it for and whether they earned too much um, and whether this was actually something that that came out of something um, uh, with a different motivation that wasn't pure in that sense. A lot of the frustrations that I heard and people please do uh, uh, share your own thoughts on this in the chat or others is that clearly any kind of leadership any kind of ambition any kind of deep engagement can't come for free. There is a cost to it. Lots of people were talking about reliance on volunteers and goodwill. And many communities that I know of rely on that. But that can only last for so long. And it very much leads to burnout and, and uh, 
some toxicity in, in, in people's emotional state, in their physical state, and often in relationships, as far as people were sharing with me. Um, it could also exclude people, those people that can't afford to volunteer, that can't afford to be around the table without any, any money. So the, 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 the money point has been an issue that has come up a great deal. Um, and being able to sort of articulate and be strong and be clear that it doesn't come for free is something people feel embarrassed about and puts people under pressure. I don't think we can afford to do that. I think people are entitled to a fair reward for the sweat and the risk. And I think lots of people share that view. Um, we get a lot of thought about there being a great deal of suspicion of people who are entrepreneurial and actually earning a decent wage or even uh, making investment in community projects and in community activity. And there's this sort of feeling that people ought not to be able to um, earn a decent amount of money. Now, without being extractive, without taking loads of money out of a system, that seems to me and seems to be rubbish. That seems to be crap. That is something that lots of people struggle with from the conversations I've had. I don't know if any of you have got experience of this. And it feels to me that it's important that you take it. So listen to Mark there, was it? some of this is a misconception. Um, for example, stood down once they become an employee and thought this was mandatory. You're absolutely spot on, Mark. Plenty of people assume that we must operate by certain rules and certain uh, conditions and, and sort of so relationships which mean that you have to stand down if you're ever going to be able to to, to um, earn any money from it. And I think that can be quite toxic um, and quite challenging. We'll come on to conflicts of interest and that point later. Um, I think it's also important that you take the fair reward because I think it, it it's about demonstrating and articulating that this isn't and challenging the view that this should be done for free for the love of the community. Not that it shouldn't have the love of community at its heart it should but it doesn't come for free and people do need to be at money they have got a life they have got ambition and they have got people to to look after and then connected with that because a lot of this comes down to suspicion is that transparency is the foundation of that trust and being clear and transparent about what's happening with the money and how people are earning it and what their involvement it seems to have come out very, very clearly, um, quite often, um, as a key point that people were talking about, invest in that transparency, not just in putting something on a website, but in helping people understand it and know about it. Alex, that's a very good point. Um, uh, it is very triggering for people. And maybe we could talk more broadly, not just about money, but as resource overall. Um, but we've got to talk, explore the individual relationships of money with my work, I completely agree. And this issue will keep coming up. Um, and that's why I say transparency and conversations about it are so critically important. So community leaders can't be in it for the money. That was the one thing that came up quite a lot in the conversations. And, and uh, we have some challenges um, in addressing that. Uh, and I do appeal as well. One thing we've got to challenge is with those that fund and support this kind of work also ascribe to this view quite often um, and won't fund or won't support things where they have any kind of suspicion of anybody um, earning any money from it. And, and that can be a real, real challenge to what we're trying to do. So we need to talk about this more. I'm going to move on to the next one. We've got an hour and I want to share what's come out of these conversations. But please do keep the chat going. And as I said, please do feel free to disagree um, or have your own views on it, because I think the value in that chat and in hearing what other people have got to say will be very useful for people on this session. So the next one, and perhaps biggest one, I don't know. I wonder if people will have a different view here. But this is where we spent a lot of our time talking um, at a lot of these sessions. Community leaders, by definition, must involve their community in every made decision. Um, I have a real personal view on this, and this has come up with lots of different people that we've spoken with, is that decision making if you boil it down to everything must be led by this amorphous sense of who this com the local people in the community, every decision must be co-created. We must start with a blank page. All the conversations we led to talked about that being a route to 
some form of lowest common denominator or it came to paralysis or it came to not being able to think huge and significant with with huge ambition and actually by formalizing and normalizing that every major decision must involve whoever this community is we get into lots of problems one of the problems is defining who that community is um so who is the community and how do we involve them is it who turns up a particular session is it who you decide who your formal members are because they may or may not be the community as they self-define it um so is it actually true that we need to involve community in every major decision? Is it actually important that sometimes we don't involve everybody? And is it important that we um, actually balance this in a much more nuanced way in order to create the kind of ambition we want for our local communities or communities of interest? And what really came out from those conversations was that we want to break down the barriers and the routes to having influence, giving people opportunities that work for them and different people at every step but not remove them because those barriers in some ways are quite important. Those barriers help people have greater involvement, grave, greater um, influence, greater responsibility. And there's certain care needed where power and influence does not match responsibility. So I'll take an example of members, um, even at the Bevy, we have 800 shareholders. We're very proud of it. Of those 800 shareholders, 400 of them don't live in our area, aren't local to the pub, very rarely turn up. Maybe 100 of 200 people are our regulars who would be our community and don't have a membership for various reasons. So who has the power legally? Does it match their engagement, their involvement and their responsibility? And what kind of perverse decisions could that lead to? There was an article that, that uh, a friend of mine, Dave Boyle, many of you will know, wrote um, which I will share shortly at the end, um, who said that decisions really are about what are people interested in, what affects their day-to-day -day life. How many people know of AGMs they've run in cooperatives where nobody turns up? We have to literally bribe people to come. Why is that? Well, perhaps what they really care about is not who's on the management committee at that point, but they care about when the pub is open. And we tend to say these operational decisions are things that are happening within uh, the, the staff team. And it's the big, big formal powers that everyone must engage on. But sometimes that's not the case. Perhaps we need to involve them more in informal ways, more listening, more engagement, more informal power, um, and not just jump to the legal powers. And connected to that in terms of leadership, I think it's come up many, many times that vision and ambition is critical. If we paralysize, pa put, put, put shackles on people at every point where you say um, you have to go to your community at every step, they have to be decided and it has to be formal, as many funders do, as many outside commentators do, that can actually crush the vision and the ambition and the leadership that's needed. It's a long game, so we don't beat ourselves up at every step and we continue to talk and iterate and have conversations with people and listening and hanging out is where it's at. There was a podcast I did with I think a couple of people, Math and Jess, who are on this, um, where we talked about involvement and decision making. And the phrase will always stick with me, um, which is um, uh, uh, what we're looking for is fish and chips on the porch with Spider-Man. And I'll break that down. Fish and chips, not formal dinners, but fish and chips hanging out on the porch, having an informal conversation, getting to know each other. Um, and with great power comes great responsibility. And there's the spy Spider-Man. Um, thank you, Oliver, for that. It's, uh, it's very important. Um, so yes, remember that. Fish and chips on the porch with Spider-Man. And let's not crush the ambition um, and let's not crush the, 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 the leadership that's needed to bring people on a journey with you by saying they must be coming from a blank space and co-creating at every step because all the experience from those community leaders that have come together on those sessions with me have said that's not the case. Um, and often that is what's demanded of people. Okay. Um, let's move on to the next one and we'll have a chance to chat 
about all of these at the end. Um, I'm going to open it up at some point. So can we move straight on to um, pass that slide to um, uh, conflicts of interest, please, Megan? Um, thanks for that, Math. Yes, governance is not a meeting, but a behavior. And I think that's absolutely at the heart of this. Um, there's a good point, Steve, uh, bringing in that you have to take the majority with you. I think that's true. Um, and it's often come up. One toxic leader has ruined, ruined many a good project. There's no doubt about that. Um, but I do think that that's partly to do with hanging out on the porch and having lots and lots of com com conversations. I have um, one here, Bob. Sorry to interrupt. Community accountability. Yes, yeah, sorry. No, um, could you jump past that just to community? Okay, leaders, brilliant. I have it now. Sorry. And, uh, right. Okay. Yeah. Where are we going? Thank you. Yeah. Um, but I also think it's not about one process, right? You do need uh, leaders to put their heads above the parapet to create the ambition. Um, and then you can have checks and balances on that, which are around ongoing conversations over the long term. That's why I said that one of the things that come out is it's about a long term view, not trying to start everything with a blank page. I hope that this is this is summarizing lots of very, very deep and nuanced conversations very quickly. Um, but uh, 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 yeah, keep, keep the chat going with your own experiences of either individual toxic leaders or trying to do things from a blank page. This one I found very interesting. Um, we talk a lot about decisions and bringing the community with you. Um, but this one is one I wasn't expecting to come out from these conversations as much. Um, but it's one that, that keeps coming up in so many different forums uh, that, that we're holding, which is around so-called conflicts of interest. It seems to be a preoccupation of many, many people um, when they look at a community project or a community business or any kind of community activity um, where they're very suspicious of so-called conflicts of interest. And this comes from local organizations, from councils, from funders, from local people. Um, and conflicts of interest is something that seems to really undermine um, many community leaders as they come through or accusations of conflicts. I think it was Jess Steele actually who's on here who once said it's not necessarily conflicts of interest, but it means you have a direct interest. And most so-called conflicts actually mean that you're involved. You have a direct interest. And fundamentally, if you don't have a direct interest in a community context, what are you doing there? I think that was a really important point. Um, uh, and I think that there's something really interesting in that is what, what what what's our relationship with conflict and direct interest if you take conflicts all out then what do you end up with a very distant or people taking decisions that aren't involved in the day-to-day -day. we take that one step further the other thing that kept coming up was the value of messiness and so not just to embrace the messiness within communities of different groups, of different people bouncing off each other, sometimes conflicting with each other, but indeed to actually design for it, to create interdependencies, not dependencies, to create ecosystems, if you like, across different areas where different community organizations, different groups, different interests have a chance to interact, to fight, to conflict, but also to work together and to share a vision um, and embracing that messiness and to design for it around interdependence, not dependence, was a comp was a session that uh, was a theme that kept coming up. It really kind of goes against this sort of um, desire, which I kept coming up for there to be one ring to rule them all. Or in essence, you know, we've got a load of community groups. Let's create one partnership board for the whole area. Let's create one network that is the overall network for the, this area. Let's create a community development association that does this whole area and does all of that work together. And that is a sort of thing that people often seem to fight against. Embrace that messiness, embrace the plurality, embrace the interdependence, and you're much stronger and more resilient. And you find a way to perhaps mitigate some of those challenges of power happy leaders, which people are commenting on, or um, one place where it all happens. Things done for efficiency reasons are not always the best, right on their math, put the mess of people first. 
um, I always think of it. I never try to create and always get wary where there's one ring to rule them all in any particular area. Um, but ecosystems are messy and that needs to be uh, embraced. So what else has come out? I've got one more um, uh, sacred cow that came up quite a lot. Could you move to the next slide, please, Megan? And this comes out of the columns uh, as well as um, uh, the conversations. So the next slide is, uh, Megan, are you there? Sorry. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, community leaders must be embedded within the community they serve. So we started up front sort of saying what is a community leader and indeed trying to define community. And one of the things that come up regularly and constantly is who is any of us to define a community? It defines itself and it's in constant iteration. And the minute you put a box and a boundary and decide what that community is, often that seems to have led to a great deal of challenges. Um, this could be done by saying this is our membership and therefore this is our community. This could be done by saying it's only people that live in this local area. Um, the experience that came up much more was that it was whoever was involved and taking a decision to move things forward and taking action and being committed to something, including people that are outside that particular area. I told you that I was on the manager committee of the Bevy Community Pub that's in East Brighton in Bevendine. Um, I don't live in Bevendine. I live 10 minutes away, but I live in a quite a different area. I would say I'm a community leader. I think many of the people there would say in some way that I am a community leader, but I'm not embedded within that community. Not in the same way that many others are. And actually, the process of me saying um, they are the local community and I am there to help them, in some ways already others it others them and it others me. I'm the outside person trying to support and nurture that community. I'm not part of that community. And I think that all the conversations I've been having with people say that that can create quite a toxic relationship. They've sort of thought about don't other a community or yourself in the process of trying to nurture it or allow yourself to be othered. So we talk sometimes about, I'm a great believer in asset-based community development. I, I have a lot of time for it. Um, but there is this talk about being alongside a community. Um, and sometimes I think the conversations go to the point where those people that may be coming from the outside or might be considered professionals um, or community workers spend so much time trying to put the community view above their own um, rather than just being a part of it on a level with others as part of that community. So much time trying to define who that community is that I'm trying to nurture that I think um, it, you get into a great deal of, of you can get into real challenges of, 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 of um, you, us and them rather than getting on with the work and, and relating to each other human to human. That's been a theme that's come out of quite a lot of these sessions um, and it's certainly in the last uh, secret community leader column um, where someone was supporting all sorts of different communities in their role. Um, so um, I've rattled through some of those sacred cows that came up um, uh, and I really wanted to um, uh, try to get some of the spirit of the other conversations we had, which is not about me preaching things or sharing things. I, I, as I said, I'm very rarely certain about what I feel or what I think, but I thought it was interesting that these were the four things that really seemed to come out of most of the conversations and also the four things that seemed to create the most tension or challenge or burnout or discussion or debate that nobody else felt they could actually talk about. Um, and they couldn't say sometimes publicly or with funders. Um, and I wanted to share those with you um, to see what you felt uh, and to bring out some of your own experiences. Um, so what I'd like to do now is, um, I think, I don't know how many people are in, I can't quite see it in the same way. Um, so it might be quite difficult if I just open up the chat to everyone and you all dive in. But I'd love somebody to share their views, whether it's, it's 44 people, okay. So whether you agree or disagree or have an example or something you'd like to share, and bearing in mind, I hope we can all sort of agree this is a confidential space. Um, would somebody in the chat say, I'd like, I have something to say um, uh, and feel free to kind of challenge anything that's come here 
Um, and if you say in the chat, yes, I'd like to share something, um, then you'll be able to speak. Cool. Thank you for that, um, Bob. Uh, yeah, so if anyone wants to opt in to share their video and audio in the top right hand corner, then they'll pop up and I'll be able to add them into the conversation to discuss some of those things. Go on, someone be let's <laughs> going. There's lots of great stuff in the chat. Here we go, right, we have Nick Anderson. Hello. Go Hi. On, Nick. Can you hear me okay? Cool. Yeah. I suppose I just wanted to um maybe a bit of um uh, I've been doing a bit of soul searching recently, let's put it that way. And I've been on working on a number of community projects voluntarily <clears throat> since the declaration of climate emergency. And I don't really feel like I've got anywhere. So I found I found myself basically from those roles <clears throat> on, in the hope that and one of the things you brought up about not being in the community, I live on the outskirts of St. Austell and I've withdrawn from the future previous St. Austell group because I didn't feel like I was part of that community. I used to work there and that helped and now I feel like I'm on the periphery. <clears throat> and then there are lots of other things with other groups I'm involved in that you've highlighted. So I suppose what I'm suffering from is doing lots of different roles, lots of different groups, don't feel like I'm getting anywhere. It's all a bit messy. And I kind of I suppose what I'm doing at the moment is regrouping and trying to decide what I can do. Because I feel like I'm not achieving what I set out to do. And other people you know, the volunteers and other people that I'm working with have their own agendas and they've and I've been trying to try and involve everyone in all decision making, I think. I think that's probably part of the problem. And I haven't really been able to achieve the things I achieve. And so I'm feeling like probably I should have been better at the start about working out what those agendas were and maybe thinking about how to um you know, mitigate what I'm trying to do with what they're trying to do. I don't know. Does that make sense? It does. <laughs> um, uh, if anyone's got any advice, adv advice or, 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 or so on to share with Nick, please, please dive in. I can see Anushka, you're about to jump in, which is great. Uh, all I want to say to you, Nick, is that you're not alone. That sort of conversation and that sort of feeling came up many, many, many times in lots of these sorts of conversations. And the thing that people often came to, uh, which is a very quick way of trying to kind of um, uh, draw out what people were talking about, is that um, uh, one is about what your goals are. So if your goals are to, you know, help and support that whole community and you're frustrated by not being able to do all of those things then maybe you're putting your too, too much on your shoulders uh, i don't know yeah you know i don't know your situation so i'm not <laughs> but that's something that came out um the other was that you whether you're in a periphery or not or involved we're all part of multiple communities even if i take my bevy example i'm part of a community of people that i know there are multiple overlapping communities of people and proximity and relationships going on in there and i'm part of some of them and not of others um, and if you go into that with a sense of um i'm here to do my bit and have a relationship with you and i will bring my whole self to this rather than try try to be the professional in this community professional relationship i'll just be part of you alongside you um then those are the spirits of mutuality that i really believe in mm. and i think help us kind of um you know, not spend so long self-flagellating. <laughs> um, there was a great deal of self-flagellation in a lot of these conversations. Yeah. And I think it was quite cathartic and it's great to hear people sort of share that self-flagellation. <laughs> but the messiness, I've often heard people describe the messiness as really hard. I think that depends on your frame of reference. If you're wanting to organize it all so it works really well and perfectly, then messiness would always be really difficult. If you see messiness as part of the way you get there because it creates the interdependence, then maybe you can relax a little. I'm not sure if that's true or not, um, but that's something that came out uh, quite often. Yeah. Sorry, Anushka, I know you're waiting also to speak, but thanks so much for being the first to share okay. something. Nick. I really appreciate that. I'll just, I'll just add there to the messiness that um, the projects I've been involved in, I am neither organised or... Uh, direct and anything I do and messiness creates wonderful space for allowing things to happen that you might not think should happen and that you don't necessarily see happening and they, and they, it allows all that creative energy to, 
to flow, so I'm all up for messiness. Um, I was going to make the point about, um, so I was involved in a project called Stretford Public Hall, and we took over community building, and there were initially three founder members who all of us really struggled to to um, find the time to work because we weren't being paid to do our to do any of it, and all of us were really in a position where we really should have been working, mm-hmm. as our partners would have liked us to. Um, and created a lot of tensions in the the homes and all that sort of, you know, stuff going on in the background. And had we been even a very, been allowed a very small amount of money to to cover childcare costs, you know, all three of us had young children we were looking after. Um, Those sorts of things would have meant that the project would have been able to have a lot more time and energy. And sometimes we found it really frustrating that there was stuff that we could have got on doing that we were paying consultants to do at a huge day rate often you know often more than we would have been looking for in a month yeah. um, and, and and at the same time losing out their skills of doing that work ourselves was deeply frustrating at the time um and it's you know I, I work a lot now with other organizations and it is possible within governance with your rules and, and um, governance to, to ensure that you can get board members, can be paid at, for piecemeal work, I think it's a really good way forward. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, my, 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 my two things I was doing weren't incorporated at all. They were just loose kind of groupings of community people. Um, one of them, um, like I say, was in also and that I think what we got caught up in was having to work in with the council a lot Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes. <laughs> and then obviously there's a turnover of council staff, so you're going back to the beginning again with somebody else, and it's and in the end it's just like sometimes you keep pushing a boulder uphill and it squashes you so often rolling back that you just go, Okay, I'm just gonna stop and think a bit and I think I think the thing about striking at the root, that's the that's the phrase that keeps coming to me. I've got to strike at the root, not fiddle around the edges. I don't know what it is yet that I need to do, but I need to have a think. <laughs> I've worked for a council for about thanks. 10 years, so I know that pain as well. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. That helps. This has been part of it. It's really good. Thank you so much for coming through. And, and I can, oh, Mando, you were about to join, or oh, Lisa. Um, brilliant. Lisa, do you want to uh, uh, jump in and join in? Or Manda as well? Okay. Um, I know Nick. She's bloody brilliant. Um, and I just had a couple of. Uh, points. T- t- I think uh, there's the re- the reference to the edge. I think the work with institutions is about dance. It's about dance, not getting exhausted. And ex- it's understanding that other people have got very different steps and might think the music is very very different. And figuring out how you become sort of lingual in that, so you don't get exhausted as a a leader. Um, and the other quick point, um, because it is exhausting. About XR actually, and I think XR really helped in that understanding what leadership isn't isn't in terms of at one's role and how through a where you think there's about this is about you in the world that are pulling this particular massive sledge, and then suddenly XR appeared and you realised there are loads and loads and loads and loads of people with huge competencies and massive energy and skills, and it's about agile response to how you engage with other, how you engage with any sort of change or each things to happen. Sometimes it's about you being it, <laughs> not being the one that's making something happen and being able to step back and somebody else to move forward. And it's it's much more like a dance than a drive forward. It's humility and courage all at the same time. Mm-hmm. I, I, I really like the da- the dance and not the drive forward. Actually, I think there's something really interesting in that. Uh, um, it's only possible and, to go um, backwards for so long, though, isn't it? <laughs> you have to go forward. Well, that is that is true. <laughs> that is true. I don't think um, it goes all right. But it's also it's quite hard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Two steps forward. You need two steps forward, one step back, not two steps back, one step yeah. forward. <laughs> yeah. uh, um, uh, I, I do wonder whether, you know, as we're going through, through this as well, um, uh, uh, there was an interesting question in this, and I'd like to bring in um, uh, 
just before Lisa speaks, um, uh, there was a question from Dickon about um, thoughts for ways that people are skeptical of community leaders as being self-serving can work with them better. Um, and, it's, and you make the point, it seems like a strong narrative that can prevent those who want to do good collaborating with those they see as community establishment. I, I completely agree this kind of self-serving, which ties up with both the money and the conflicts kind of point has come up time and time again. Um, uh, and at the heart of it, although it, uh, uh, what's often come up is this question of transparency. Um, transparency and motivation, um, honesty with oneself about uh, what you want to get out of it and honesty with others about what you're there to get out of it and to be unashamed of it in a way. Um, what we often try to do is sort of avoid the question because we think people might think that, that they'll think ill of us. But um, what seems to have come up quite often is that if you are clear, if you are transparent, it won't always sort everybody out but it can be quite flooring to sort of say well yes of course i'll get a fair reward of course i've got an interest in that but this is why it works and this is why it makes sense and so transparency is quite important but also transparency isn't just about putting stuff out there it's putting stuff out there in ways that people can engage with and understand uh, uh, regularly i don't know if that answers your point dickon but i just wanted to pick that up because that's what came out quite often um sorry lisa i just wanted to pick that up but but you've jumped in so please do share what you were going to share so um, I just wondered, Bob, if you see any changes at the top in, said, in, in terms of embracing some of these sacred cows, whether some of the big funders are starting to accept that maybe some of the theory they're working on isn't quite right in practice. And particularly I'm asking that because I know there's a campaign for a community wealth fund, which will be... It seems to me, I'm not sure, I think it's all in development, but it seems to me a similar project to the local trust, big local sort of resident-led place-based change. And I'm and I'm slightly terrified that all these sacred cows are going to be transferred and, and taken forward for another decade, you know, with, with a programme like that. And I just wondered if you had any insight there from the people you might be working with. Yeah, well, t two things to say before I answer. I helped set up Power to Change Trust um, uh, as a foundation um, and uh, uh, you know we're in the safe space and confidential I've got lots of admiration still work with Pounds to Change in lots of ways but still has plenty of those challenges Lisa that you raised I'm also on the board of Local Trust um, who are advocating for the Community Wealth Fund which is um, uh, and these are the things that concern us and we talk about a lot um, uh, so I think there is a recognition of it increasingly um, I can't say um, I still see it play out so often though not just necessarily at what at boards and senior exec level but all the way down to say the person viewing your grant application you know simple as that who approaches it from a mentality of if you are um, a community organization you, it must be pure and must be no conflict and must be all of these things um, so I uh, I don't know if other people have other things to share. I, I still remain quite worried about that in any version of what we're doing now. Um, I think that we've got a lot to say. Uh, uh, hopefully, the one thing that COVID might have done is demonstrate a little more the power and the potential of community and entrepreneurial communities that allow us to blur those lines a little further between what is a community, what's a local business, what's a, uh, you know, so there's a bit more of a sort of blurring of those sectors. But one of the things I think it was a throwaway comment, but, but it came out quite a lot is not only to take your fair reward and to be honest and transparent, but to really make sure people know it and to push back with funders. I feel like most of us community leaders can't be shy about these things if we're going to change the mindset and the conversation. And that's something that, that I feel certainly a responsibility for, um, you know, to be able to say about challenge these sacred cows at every step can be really hard to do but if you do it consistently um, most of the people that we've been talking to say that that does help pay dividends over the long term but I can't give you a, a total um, yeah it's all going to be fine I'm afraid <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, I, I hope that's sort of answered in some way thank you um, and sort of Rachel there thank you for sharing that you know I used to feel scared about being transparent but actually helps me put the purpose and intention first that's the kind of message that's been coming through consistently um, uh, transparent with everybody, funders included. Um, Mark, do you want to 
come in. You've made a few comments I'm just trying to follow whilst having the conversation. I don't know if you want to just um, share them. Yeah. I'm just going to leave so that Mark can join, make it easier. Oh, okay. Thanks so much, Nick. Cheers. I saw Mark come in. I don't know if you can let him in, Megan. Hi, yeah, yeah. I just, uh, oh, here we are. Here we have Mark. Uh, here we are. Yeah, it takes a little while to uh, oh, to get in. And I was downstairs cooking on my headset as well. So, um, yeah, so <laughs> I, I think one of the sort of bits of clunkiness around the governance and the stuff we're talking about now is the fact that we, we're often creating... Uh, enterprises that have a, um, a community ownership, which is basically a community investment ownership. It's the people who could afford to buy shares at the time, particularly with things like community-owned pubs uh, and shops. Uh, and I think one of the things I'm exploring, which might provide a partial answer to some of this, is that rather than the thing you create at the start of it, where you save the pub or whatever, that we can then morph to a model where the community just becomes the steward of that asset, but doesn't have to run the business activity. But then we could create uh, models where um, effectively the community is just the steward of the asset. It owns the commons, but then basically has tenant businesses. Uh, for, so you can imagine your pub being owned by a worker cooperative of the staff there. So looking to create models where we can easily transition from that. We can still have the community buyout to start with, but then we move towards that in a way that, that's not seen to be threatening or difficult. Uh, rather similar to the way they're looking in the tech sector with platform co-ops now, where they've got this exit to community thing, particularly in, with people like Nathan Schneider in the States. How can you get a big chunk of money at the start to develop these platforms, which are then owned by the communities that are trading them? So check, that's what I was talking about. Very interesting. Thank you for sharing that, Mark. And and there's lots in that. Um, I, I'll give you a, 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 people feel free to dive in as well. I just wanted to share a couple of thoughts on that because um, I think it speaks to some broad themes that were coming out of the conversations, which was um, at, at the bevy, for example, we have lots of shareholders who are not necessarily the people to whom we want to be accountable, but they happen to be shareholders because they had the money, as you suggested. And we're moving uh, to a membership scheme. Um, oh, well, there you go, Oliver. I, I think that's what you might be saying. Um, we're, we're, we're changing it so that um, actually uh, we have a membership that is different um, and actually you can become a member and not have to pay purely by being a volunteer or involved and turning up and splitting that away from um, the shareholders who become contributor members uh, through finance uh, there's a lot more into that but there is something about you know that support that the the only thing i i would say is that this is a constant iteration of who do to whom do we really want to be accountable how do they get involved what are the barriers to that and one of the things that i have a, a, has kept coming up is we're very quick to jump to models and formal structures and processes and solutions uh, to try to define the community and get the right people on it um do we spend enough time hanging out on the porch as i sort of explained before um and testing these more informal or, or 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 informal power structures um that come through transparency through sharing conversations through um demonstrating what we're doing through having open forums uh, i think there's a real relationship between the two and what we often hear is that uh jumping too quickly to the formal um often means you're led by the formal rather than the formal and the process being support of the culture and the relationships and the listening and the hanging out on the porch which starts first that's what's come out quite a lot mm -hmm. um but i'm fascinated by lots of the models you're suggesting as well oh yeah that's only um, the tip of I the think iceberg there is a challenge there yeah yeah i, I can well imagine <laughs> yeah at, at the hall we had a, a dual um we've got a dual membership where we have community um shares and a membership scheme as well so um but members have exactly the same um rights of voting and and being on the board and being involved so it's quite a good good way of making sure that everyone is able to have their voice heard hmm. i'm actually suggesting even more complex models where you might your land trust might be a secondary co-op of the businesses that are the tenants of it so for instance i'm working with a community-owned farm in the north of england 
that it will have possibly a dozen tenant businesses operating within that farm, but they're all members of the farm land trust, which also includes the people who've enabled that thing to happen as well, the investors. Check. Very interesting. I'm hoping you might be joining us on Friday. For I'm going to bit quick plug for the community business mutual aid group where we're talking a bit about land and structures. I, I, I might try to see if you can join us on that on the, then, Mark. Um, one thing I wanted to share a couple of things in the chat that I think is worth bringing out. Uh, um, Phil said about being transparent and honest enough to hold your hand up and and don't. Oh, thanks, Mark. Um, uh, and don't and say I don't know sometimes is vital in gaining trust. I couldn't agree more. The vulnerability point is a big part of it. Um, a couple of other things that, that came up for um, for Rachel's actual I think is, is really worth kind of drawing out, um, uh, which was I lost it now. Um, yeah, what what Math was saying there about um, we can't wait for the funders in response to what Lisa was talking about. First, we have to challenge them. I agree that's come out quite a lot. If we're going to try and uh, change the narrative and the dialogue here, it, we can't wait for them to kind of get with the program. Sorry, Rachel. No waiting, so waiting no, it's fine. <laughs> well, I was waiting to come in because so much of what you've been saying and everyone has been saying has resonated with me. Um, I am speaking from um, an experience that I have. I set up a startup. I refer to it as a startup. It's just in beta. Um, but looking at a crowdfunding model for um, digital pre-sales for environmental products, trying to bring um, kind of, I suppose, ethical or which is a really, you know, sustainable products onto um, local shelves. And so I was working with small businesses in local communities to bring those products in through pre-sales. It's an experiment. We've only done a couple of campaigns. What's been interesting to me is by doing that, so it's not traditional community ownership in, in some of the ways we've been talking about, but the it's a, we're working with a convenience store. It's a local shop. Most people who go in there aren't thinking about community ownership or anything like that. They just want to buy a pack of crisps. But they then came across the model that I use and went, oh, right, yeah, so if I just prepay for this thing, it you know, brings it into the shop. Oh, you've done it. Great. I'll do it too. And by doing that, the, the community that's evolved around this shop has started talking to themselves as like being almost like co-owners of the shop. The shop's moving. When are we moving? You know, they want the business to do well. They were happy to part with their money. They want me to do well, which is interesting because I'm supporting the business. So the fi financial embarrassment I felt about going, oh, well, I, I'm going to take a fee, you know, um, uh, actually was totally fine with everyone. Um, we went ahead and did it without, because I'm a startup, I just went and did it. Now the council are like, oh, what did you, sorry, what did you, how, how do you, you know? So it's it's become a, it is it is a different model and it's just, it's only happened a couple of times. So it's not something I can speak to beyond that. But I just wanted to talk about that kind of aspect of involving communities that don't know about this stuff um, and how that can kind of come in and yes, and just, having a go I just massively had a go I didn't know what I was doing and just went for it and by saying that yeah. made people be able to say well it was good but maybe you could try this next time so there we go that was a great story thank no you worries. Rachel that resonated so much I mean so much of what came out of the other conversations we'd have so I really appreciate that um just having a go being honest again the transparency all of those things kind of picked it, it, it picked up um, really, really well. And I love the idea that they wanted you to be successful as well, which yeah. I think does, you know, it can, can absolutely happen. Um, I, I'm aware that um, we're coming towards the end of a session. Um, and in a way, this is kind of a bit of a taster of the days and the half days that we then uh, work together on. Um, so what I would like to sort of uh, suggest is that, um, would there be a debrief session? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, we, we are going to be having, as I said up here, um, a secret community leader uh, is being published. We're going to be having more of these sessions after every column is published. We're going to be doing half day conversations like this and building this kind of knowledge base. Um, the other thing is that we're sort of looking to create some kind of space within that every quarter for every anyone to turn up and just share um, their their thoughts or or ideas in this kind of a way and be able to get support from each other um, and just keep this conversation alive because a lot of what people have said is we need to have more spaces where we can cut through some of these sacred cows and get to the nub of of, of what we're dealing with 
Um, so I hope that gave you a taster. I hope it was interesting. Um, and um, uh, very happy to have uh, uh, whole further sessions and spaces. We will let people know, share the slides. And did we save the chat, Megan? Because there was some yeah, links so some the, things that people posted. The session is recorded and we'll put that up in the expo booth later on. Uh, this evening and all of the chat will appear in that too with all the links and we'll go through and pull out as many as we can as a team as well so if anyone's interested yeah. like Bob was saying if you go to stirtoaction.com secret hyphen community hyphen leader then it tells you more about the articles and then the post um, post article discussion forums for those as well great Great. And thanks for commenting on my headset. Um, uh, I don't think it's mini cab firm. I, I'm told it's Britney Spears. No, I think so. That's Maybe a bit of both. For anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks, everyone, so much for, for participating and engaging with the conversation. It was brilliant to sort of virtually meet you all. Always happy to get in touch and talk to anyone. If you want to share my email, always up for a conversation. Um, and so grateful for the people that contributed in the chat and the conversation. There's some brilliant people on that list that I know and some more that I've met today. So um, yeah, be, be a part of this, check the stuff out, come to the future conversations, we'll let you know. Um, um, love and solidarity to you all. Enjoy the rest of the festival. Thank you very much, everyone. Take care.